ready to be seated, we will get started. Is it working? Well, welcome everybody. We're so glad you're here. Um, and you know, before we go any further, I would love to have all the veterans stand up and be recognized. Could all the veterans stand up, please? Thank you so much for your service and for being here tonight. So, um, a very special thanks to Nancy Woodson, um, real estate, for her community support of tonight's meeting. And Nancy's um, in the back there, so you can go and talk to her if you'd like. Um, I'd also like to thank Conifer Jazzercise. They provide the water for us at our town hall meetings. And then also Sharon Trilk of My Mountain Town for videotaping the meetings. And she videotapes all the meetings, um, so you can always go to her, uh, My Mountain Town to see the town hall meetings there. Our speakers tonight, and we have a few of them, um, they have been asked to present just the facts, um, not to support, um, not in support of, or opposition to any person, campaign, development, anything like that. Um, so we ask them to present just the facts and um, be very non-controversial on that. And most of you have been here many times. I see a lot of familiar faces. I also see a bunch of um, young men here that you guys probably haven't been here too many times. So thanks for being here. Um, we do not have comments or questions during the presentations. So from 7 to 8, we'll have several people speaking. Again, no comments or questions. But then at 8 o'clock, we will um, break for an open house, and the presenters will stay here. And you can ask your questions. Um, you know, talk to them about whatever you'd like to. So if you can just wait till 8 o'clock for that, that would be great. So what's going on around here? Um, lots. There's lots going on. Um, first of all, uh, Jeannie Boimel is going to come up and talk about what's happening with the Conifer Chamber. <laughs> if, if she can get up here. Do you want to just stay right there? I'll stand right here. Okay, here you go. All right, I brought my cheat sheet of all the amazing things going on over the next three weeks here in the Conifer area for, from the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm Jeannie Boybell, I'm a member of the board. Uh, so I'll be here if you guys have any questions about what's going on. But uh, maybe take a note of a couple of dates here. We have a lot going on for the next three weeks. November 16th is the day that starts it off for us. Um, from 3.30 to 7 o'clock, and then November 17th from 9.30 to 1, both are our um, Festival of Trees. So we will have Santa Claus um, at the Festival of Trees. You can look at trees, bid on trees, vote on the trees. Um, they're sponsored by our local businesses. And it's just a way to get the community together and kick off our holiday season. Um, you can also buy trees the following night on Saturday evening, the 17th, from 4 to 7.30 is our Festival of Trees and Wine Tasting. And there'll be hors d'oeuvres from local um, culinary people, uh, local caterers and things. Also local wine. So that will be, um, like I said, from 4 to 7.30. And then there's also a silent auction associated with that. And you can also get your Christmas tree already decorated. So that's the really neat part of that. So I do it every year. It's my favorite thing because I don't have to get out all of my decorations. I just go buy an already decorated tree. And the money goes to the chamber and um, to all the people that we have um, as our um, sponsors. Uh, let's see. And then November 24th. So if you're around for Thanksgiving, November 24th is Small Business Saturday. So we all go shopping on Black Friday, right? On the Saturday is Small Business Saturday. So we're meant to support local small businesses. So please come check out all of our local conifer evergreen. Yes, ma'am. Where is this? So the, the, oh, sorry. The Tomahawk Ranch is where the Festival of Trees is. Thank you very much. Um, it's at Tomahawk Ranch in Bailey. 
So I can give you the address also if you would like to look that up, but it's in Bailey off of 43, just past Deer Creek Elementary School. Um, and then the Small Business Saturday is just all the local businesses up here, so that's just around on, um, on Saturday. And then our uh, December 1st Christmas Parade. So um, that's sponsored by Remax Alliance this year, and that is starting at 2 o'clock. Now Santa will also be here for that. So if you're interested in seeing Santa, he will also be here from, uh, I believe the activities start at 10.30 in the morning, and that's where all of the elevation celebrations, so kind of back behind the Chamber of Commerce there, that's where that all starts. And of course the parade starts here at West Jeff Jr. and then goes all the way to downtown, down Sutton Road. Um, so that is 10.30 to 4 is all the festivities, but the actual parade starts at 2 p.m. Um, and this year's theme is Candyland. So we have um, still some room for entrance if you know of anybody who still would like to put a float in. Um, we still have room for that as well. And um, I know that we're going to have some, some great flips coming through on that. And lastly, oh, holiday raffle. So uh, we also have at the Christmas parade, you have the opportunity to win $1,000 cash. So we're selling raffle tickets. Angela has them there in the back. I have some also, but I think she would rather sell them, so I'd like to see Angela, that would probably be better. Um, so those tickets are $5 a piece, or you can get five for $20. And um, the winner will be announced on the main stage at the parade around 3 o'clock. And um, you do not have to be present to win. So even if you're not going to be here on December 1st and you purchase tickets, if you win, we promise we will get you that information. So I think that's everything. Tomahawk Branch for the Festival of Trees all those days, and then Small Business Saturday, and then the parade. Thanks, Jeannie. That's a lot. Yeah, the chamber's really, really active, especially this time of year. And Jeannie will be back here, and Angela's back there, so you guys can get the address if you need it for Tomahawk Ranch. So next, we have um, Janice Spiker and Steve Harrelson with CDOT here um, to talk about all kinds of stuff. Here you go. Hi, good evening. My name is Jana Spiker, and I'm with CDOT. I'm a resident engineer there. And we're here tonight to um, give you guys some information and an update from when we last talked, I guess, what, September was the last town hall meeting. Uh, so I'll start with the King Valley Interchange Project. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar or haven't been to those meetings or these meetings before, uh, CDOT is underway um, designing a interchange that will grade separate Kings Valley Drive. So Kings Valley will go over US 285, and that interchange would be located south of the existing intersection. So as I said, we're under design of that project, and that is about a 10 to 12 month design schedule, primarily driven by any property or right away acquisitions that might need to occur to facilitate that project. So that being said, um, the project is about an eight to $10 million project, and um, we have about 5.5 million of that, um, eight to 10 million. So depending on where final quantities come in, final numbers as we advance final design, we might be in the neighborhood of 2.5 to 4.5 million dollars short. But we are working with other partners and pursuing other funding opportunities um, to secure full funding and open for the, the real project. So that being said, many of you may be uh, aware that Proposition 109 and 110 would have also um, contributed to constructing the Kings Valley Interchange, as well as widening 285 between Richmond Hill and Schaefer's Crossing. However, those were unsuccessful, so that funding would not be um, will not be realized and would not be contributed to that project. But again, we will continue to pursue other avenues. Um, that being said, I would like to introduce Steve Harrelson. He'll talk to you more about funding at CDOT. Thank you. Thanks, Jana. Um, so, with uh, 109 and 110 failing, I mean that. Uh, certainly a, a message to CDOT. Um, one of the elements um, in Senate Bill 1, which was passed a year ago in the legislature, was that if citizens passed or citizen-initiated uh, referendum are brought to the voters this past week, and if they fail, then they, there's one more shot, and that's a year from now, and it is another referendum that's, that's codified in Senate Bill 1, 
Um, as it's currently written, it is for uh, $2.3 billion of bonded indebtedness and no new tax. Um, so that will uh, possibly be modified by the legislature this year. We don't know, um, but it's, it's likely to uh, be on the ballot again next fall. So uh, I, I guess CDOT's kind of, you know, all these, these big list of projects that uh, was prepared for this fall will likely be modified a little bit for um, the Senate Bill 1 referendum that will come in a year. Um, you know, if the legislature adjusts the, the nature of that, which I, I suspect there's a good chance that they will, um, to, to try to address some of the concerns voiced by the voters this fall, um, we'll see what happens. I, I know the legislature's uh, changed in makeup, and uh, we'll see, see where we go. Um, CDOT currently has a annual construction budget of between $650 and $700 million a year. Um, much of that is used to maintain existing facilities, repaving um, roads, rebuilding bridges that were built 50 or 60 years ago, that sort of thing. Additional capacity, we just don't have a whole lot of money for. Um, that being said, we're, we are trying to get the, the um, Kings Valley overpass done. There will be no associated widening, but that's a, a very appealing project because it, it does address a safety concern. So um, we're, we're not out of business. We're still, we're still working. We're still seeking funding, um, but it's, it's a little uh, more grim than we'd hoped it would be this week, but uh, we're not giving up. Thank you. Thank you, Steve and Jana. Okay, next we have Peggy Catlin. She is our RTD director. Um, she was voted in um, last Tuesday. So, Peggy, here you go. Thank you. This is quite a crowd. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the Boy Scouts for coming. It's really nice to see you in the front row here today. Um, I used to work for CDOT. Back when I worked for CDOT, we had a bigger budget than they have today. When I was listening to the numbers, I just was kind of stunned. So um, it's been a struggle over the last 18 months, or 18 years, excuse me. Um, there's three things I'd like to just mention today. Um, a couple of them are some new pilots and initiatives that RTD is going to embark upon. And if, you know, if we're successful, they, they may impact the mountain communities such as Conifer and Evergreen. Um, the call and ride vehicles that you see up at the Senior Resource Center, the green buses, those are going to be rebranded. And there's a movement afoot across the country to utilize services such as something called microtransit, which means that you can allow some flexibility, call and demand, get rider and demand. It's similar to Uber and Lyft. We're looking at, at changing those vehicles on those column ride vehicles and call them a flex ride. They can be a little bit more flexible. I'd like to point out one that um, we were successful in implementing in South Jeffco. There was a fixed route, the 85 route, that took people from West Ken Carroll over to the Mineral Station. And um, it was scheduled to be dropped because of low, low ridership. Instead, we took one of the call and ride vehicles and put it on the fixed route during the peak hour. So four trips in the morning, four trips in the evening, but then during the midday, it still operated as a call and ride um, on-demand service. So those are some of the types of things that RTD would like to pilot to look at in some of the lower density um, communities in the metropolitan region. Speaking of pilots, um, there's a really exciting pilot going on with autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles, shuttles. And this is pilot's probably going to start the beginning of the year out at the Panasonic facility near um, DIA. And it will be a, another small vehicle that will be driverless. There will be a person monitoring it, but they're experimenting with that pilot um, in a fairly low traffic area to see if it could be utilized in other places. So I think that's kind of an exciting utilization of up and coming technology. Um, and the goal isn't ridership, the goal is really just to see if, if this is a possibility for moving forward in the future. The third item I'd like to talk about is, is quite a bit more detailed and given the, the short time. Um, I know some of you might be interested in the A line and the G line, which are the commuter routes. 
when the A line is open to Denver, um, you, or from Denver Union Station to DIA, but the G line, which is the extension to the west, has not yet opened. Um, there is a town hall as we speak, telephone town hall as we speak with uh, Director, um, uh, General Manager Genova. Um, I encourage you to go on the website and check that out. It will be recorded for some of the details. And I'm happy to answer any questions back um, at the table if you all are interested in some of the particulars that, it's going, that are going on here. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, next we have um, a report about the Conifer High School, or the Conifer Library, um, and Samantha Conway is to talk about that. Samantha. Thank you. Hi, yes, I'm Samantha. I work at the Conifer Public Library, and she is correct. We are inside Conifer High School. So if you haven't come visited us, come see us. Um, I wanted to highlight tonight one of our system-wide programs that we are just in the beginning stages of. I mean, it's our Epic STEM Challenge. So it's geared towards middle schoolers. So if you know a middle schooler or you are a middle schooler, you think you would be interested in participating, uh, registration is open right now. You can register either as an individual or in teams of up to four, where together you will identify a social challenge and then propose a STEM-based solution. So think science fair type projects. Um, one of the unique things about this is that the participants will get mentoring and coaching from college students who are in STEM-based fields right now. Um, these mentorship meetups will actually be taking place at libraries down the hill, so Belmar, Columbine, Golden, uh, but it should be pretty interesting. And even if you think you want to participate but don't have an idea, at the very first meetup, um, the mentors will help you develop a project to work on. So all of this is going to culminate in a um, presentation competition on February 2nd at the fairgrounds where the winners can receive $500 for their school. So, some good excitement happening right here. So, if you know anyone who is interested, please take a look at that. Um, more locally, at Conifer Library, coming up on December 14th, we will have our holiday open house. So, yummy snacks, activities, music, fun times for all. Um, and if you are interested in making a gift for someone this holiday season, on December 1st, we are going to be having a glass etching program. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can come stop by, you can etch, etch something onto uh, glass drinkware, and gift it to someone this holiday. So um, as always, please come stop by and see us. We have lots more going on, but we'd love to see you. So thank you. Thanks, Samantha. So you all in your packets have a list of all of the developments that are at least in the planning stages right now in um, the Conifer area. And Mike and Alicia from Jefferson County Planning and Zoning are going to talk a little bit about some of those developments that are at least in planning. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Madrid. I'm a senior planner at Jefferson County Planning and Zoning. And uh, we're here to uh, go over a few cases uh, tonight uh, in your packets. As uh, Shirley said, there are uh, a list of 30 cases um, that are active or in the planning stages uh, of uh, a process at the county right now. Uh, we're going to go over just a, a couple of them uh, in a slideshow, but if you have any other questions afterward, uh, we'll be at that table right over here uh, to answer any questions about any of those cases and to uh, answer what we can. So I will hand it off to Alicia and she'll get us started. Hi, I'm Alicia. I'm a planner with Jefferson County Planning and Zoning as well. Um, so what's going on in Conifer? Um, we've got 30 cases in the packet there. Um, we're going to go over a handful of them now, um, sort of the latest and greatest. Um, I'm going to go over uh, two pre-application meetings and one community meeting, um, and then Mike's going to uh, look at some of the zoning cases underway. Um, so what are pre-application meetings? These are sort of an introductory meeting, a preliminary request. Um, when somebody's interested in maybe developing a property, whether that's a rezoning, a subdivision, um, or a site development plan, uh, they come in and hopefully start it off with us at the pre-application meeting, meeting with a planner and an engineer on staff 
to give us a sense of what their plans are, and getting some official comments back based on what's in our comprehensive plan, as well as something like the conifer area plan. Um, about 40 to 50 percent of these pre-applications don't move forward. Um, they just have the meeting and they sort of end there. Um, there's no public notice involved in the pre-application process, so you may not have heard of this before. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the pre-application cases. Um, the first case here is on 12753 Upper Ridge Road. Um, it's a rezoning to allow a telecommunications facility, and it's on 40 acres. Um, there hasn't been a community meeting yet. Um, that would come after the pre-application process if they choose to move forward with the rezoning. Um, it is to allow a new broadband internet tower, which is designed to look like a fire lookout tower. Uh, the next pre-application meeting I'm going to talk about, um, 26209 Pleasant Park Road, um, and the property just to the north. Um, it's a pre-application for a rezoning to allow 350 uh, residential units as well as limited commercial units. It uses two vacant parcels that uh, total to about 70 acres. There also hasn't been a community meeting for this yet because it's a pre-application meeting. So if it moves forward with the rezoning process, that's when the community <coughs> meeting will take place. Speaking of community meetings, um, so that's the first step in a rezoning or special use. It's not required for a plat or a site development plan, so a plat would be like subdividing land. A uh, site development plan would be a process that you need in order to develop commercial properties. Um, notice is sent to adjacent homeowners and HOAs in the area that the community meeting is taking place. It's a great time for a discussion with the applicant about what their intent is, what might be happening in this process, getting questions and comments. A planner usually attends these meetings to uh, get a feel for the room, um, but no decisions are made at this meeting. So there's one community meeting uh, that's taking place at 16675 County Road 126. Um, I should say that it didn't take place there. It probably takes place at a, a nearby location. Um, this is to discuss a rezoning to allow for the Pine Grove History Park. Um, this was generally supported by those in attendance, but there were some concerns over details, such as structures. Um, if you want more information on this, you can definitely visit us at the table over to your left here uh, after the presentations are finished. I'm going to hand it off, uh, back off to Mike to talk about rezoning processes. All right, so after a pre-application and a community meeting uh, is when a rezoning would be uh, applied for at that time. Uh, the community meeting is a requirement of the rezoning process. Uh, it allows for uh, a parcel of land or <coughs> parcels of land to change the allowed use um, of the actual property, uh, changing what's allowed to be built there or to be done there. Um, there's a form modification process that goes along with it. Um, the, these cases are heard in front of the Planning Commission. Uh, the, the Planning Commission is a board of nine members of volunteers who are appointed by the Board of County Commissioners to uh, to give a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners on land uh, development cases like rezonings. Uh, but ultimately, the decision for rezoning, whether it's approved or denied, is made by uh, our Board of County Commissioners, who are a board of uh, three elected officials. Uh, the first rezoning I'll go over uh, tonight is uh, 18051 County Road 126. Uh, this is uh, where the Blue Jay Inn is, is to rezone uh, the Blue Jay Inn to allow it to become a bed and breakfast. Uh, the community meeting was held uh, almost a year ago at this point. Um, the referral uh, was sent out. What a referral is, is, is taking all of the documents from the formal application of a rezoning and sending it out to internal and external agencies uh, at the county or special districts in the county uh, to, pro to provide uh, planning and zoning their own comments uh, specific to what they do on the case. So that's where this case sits. Uh, it's gone through one of those exchanges. Uh, the plan actually recommends a, an area of stability and, and other uses for this uh, area, uh, meaning uh, similar lot sizes to what's around it, and uh, there are other considerations in the comp plan, and, and again, we'll, we'll be available after this meeting to answer any of your questions as well. Uh, the next, uh, and I'm sorry, the numbers on the on these slides actually correspond to the numbers in the packet. So um, when I said rezoning number 22, that's actually number 22 on the list. 
So uh, this rezoning is kind of for heights uh, 10250 County Highway 73. This is a rezoning to uh, allow 104 single family attached residential, I'm sorry, yeah, single family attached residential units on 25 acres. Community meeting was held earlier this year in March. The first referral again in this case has been completed, meaning that all of the referral agencies have gotten their comments to planning and zoning uh, and sent back to the applicant to revise their documents uh, to address some of the comments in those referral uh, responses. Uh, this uh, area, the plan recommends residential, office, and community uses. Now, site development plans are, uh, are administrative processes, they're not public processes like a variance or a rezoning would be. Uh, by administrative, I mean there's no public hearings for these cases, they're all handled administratively. There still is a formal application process that goes along with these, but ultimately the decision to approve or deny uh, is uh, in the hands of the Director of Planning and Zoning. Again, like Alicia said, site development plans are the, process to, um, are the processes to allow construction of commercial, industrial, multifamily, or any other building that wouldn't just be allowed plainly through a building permit through our office. So these uh, uses are already allowed by the zoning, and they're just in to actually construct uh, what's allowed by their zone. Uh, number 27 on our list is 13034 US Highway 285. This is the uh, Emmaus site, um, where a uh, site development plan to, constru to construct an adult retreat and conference center is on roughly 241 acres, and it's in the second referral right now. Um, uh, what I just heard from our case manager on this one, though, is that the applicant has submitted the, a third uh, referral for this case, so now it'll enter into the, the next referral stage for it. Uh, the next one I have on the list is number 30 on your list, which is the last one, uh, Connor for Self Storage uh, at the 26209 Clark <coughs> Avenue, uh, site development plan to construct uh, mini storage. Uh, I believe it was approved uh, on October 26th, so they are clear to come in and get a building permit to construct their self-storage site. Um, thank you for coming out and uh, taking a look at all these cases that are going on. If you have another question about any other case in the packet, we will be available to your left after uh, the presentation. Uh, we have other information uh, regarding Mountain Living and, and Water Smarts as well, and uh, also our cards if you want to get in touch with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike and Alicia. Um, so as you can tell, there's a lot going on. Um, you have all the information in your packets to um, contact the case manager, go down to the meetings, whatever, but get involved. Um, you know, let's make these cases and projects the best that they can be. Okay, so um, we had a spectacular water availability meeting on November 3rd. How many were you were at that meeting? Great, quite a few of you. Well, it was really a great meeting. Um, Peter Barkman um, chaired that um, event and the whole process. He is with the Geological Survey and he is also a board advisor for Conifer A Council. Peter's just going to give a little recap of that meeting. Thanks, Shirley. And uh, yes, we did have quite the meeting on November 3rd. And a lot of people came here early. We started at 8. And uh, we're still here at about quarter of 12, and there were over 100 people, and 70 were still here at the question and answer, so it was fantastic turnout. I have to apologize to those who had other things going on, like a Christmas boutique and a Christmas fest that we pulled people away. We had captured some of your uh, audience and had them here, but it was a, a good turnout. We This was a, a general education meeting. It was... We formed this water committee back in the spring uh, after the first town hall meeting of the year uh, and recognizing that there was a lot of concern in the community with these developments that are coming in and the, the, the perceived uh, threat to our water supply and wondering is there enough water. So we formed a committee to try to work with this issue, well not to try, we will work with the issue and our first objective was to have just basic education so the community understands. We cover the physical presence of water. We cover the watershed water balance. We cover water quality. And, and then just administration, you know, you know, how do you administer your water rights? And then planning and zoning covered how they work with water. 
So we tried to cover all bases of the basics uh, just so the community becomes better educated. If you're better educated and you want a response, if you want to respond to one of these developments, if you go to a planning and zoning uh, hearing or a commissioner's hearing and speak with more education, you'll be heard a little bit better. So our objective is to help the community understand all the ins and outs of uh, water up here. I think we'll do more. Uh, we'll see. One of the things that we're going to do is send out a questionnaire to those who signed in uh, asking for feedback. We'd like to, to get a sense of what people thought of the content and, and what else they'd like to hear. So that'll be one of the next steps. We're, we're compiling the PowerPoint presentations as a PDF and we'll send them out to those who want them in emails. They'll also be available on our website. So there'll be access to what we already covered. Um, another uh, thing, I had some uh, groundwater atlases that I was giving away and I brought a few more here and we ran out of them so they're available you can see me about it. One of the challenges we had with this meeting, many of you may have heard, is one of our speakers, our committee member and speaker who passed away just days before our, uh, our seminar, which was a real shock. We, uh, you know, not only did we lose a friend, but we had to uh, get our act together and making the seminar work. Unfortunately, uh, Matt Wickham stepped in was, and was able to cover it. was Mike Fahey, Fahey those who may have known Mike, Big Mike. Uh, he was well-respected, widely recognized uh, hydrogeologist with the United States Geological Survey and was part of our committee and he'd come to our committee meetings on oxygen and the cane. So he was dedicated and really vested in the community. He lived up here and it was really important to him to contribute to what we're doing. And it's a real loss. So what we've done is we're setting up a memorial fund that we'll have to think about how we use it to, to, to buy equipment for sampling or measuring wells or use it for scholarships. We'll, we'll see what we can do. We're still trying to figure out what we want to do with the loss of Mike, but we want to remember him for what he did. Uh, another thing we'd like to, and I'd like to reach out to you, the members of the community, our next step here is to look at data. We're going to look at what data we already have and see what we can do with the data we have. If people have uh, production data for their wells or water level data, water quality that you're willing to share, let me know. We'll, we'll wrap it into our, our, our basin or our area-wide study so it would help. We can also take data and keep it anonymous if you don't want people to know where it came from. And then we're going to go on and, and look at other studies and see what we can do. We need to think about what sort of other studies can be done that will be useful to the county in making good decisions on what happens when it comes up. There has to be the political will to take care. If we collect the data, is it going to make a difference or do we just, is it a waste of money? So I see Angela's got the time card up and I will step aside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, and thanks for chairing that committee. That's a really important one. Um, next, we have Commander Steve Wygant with the Jeff Coast Sheriff's Department. Um, there's been a few things happening up here, but he's going to talk a little bit about that and what they're doing and what you can do to prevent it. Steve. On behalf of Sheriff Schrader, thanks for inviting me to come tonight, Shirley. Crime rates in Conifer. I won't talk about the mountains in general. I'll just talk about Conifer. We still enjoy really good crime rates, if that's a way to say it. Um, the, the, uh, the people in the mountains are different than the people in the lowlands. In the sense that they are a community, and they take care of one another, and they watch out for one another quite a bit better because of the things that you guys have dealt with. Like, for example, fire. Every time you guys see a spark anywhere, we get a call, and we, we need that call. We want to go to that call because you guys are concerned about your community. But the networking that you do help us and help you with better, better crime rates. We have had a few things come up with the increased population. Most of the people coming from down the hills, people who don't live here, at least we don't believe. Um, hitting parks and then coming up to the mountains because it's beautiful. People like to come up to the mountains. 
The, the, the spikes that we have seen are in things that we call criminal trespasses to motor vehicles. It's probably the biggest thing that we would be concerned about. Not a huge problem in the mountains, though. It really isn't. What that is, is when somebody opens up a car or breaks into a car with the intent to, to commit a crime therein. That means if you had a car that had a purse in it and somebody opened that car door, didn't break anything, took the purse, that's a first degree criminal trespass. We're seeing more of those on occasion and we usually see them in what we call sprees. People will come up to the mountains, find a neighborhood that's got 15 houses in it, and they'll go to those houses and they'll take the doors that are open. We're finding that 50% of the crime that's reported is for car doors that are left open. And they have things inside of them, like purses, the keys in the ignition, uh, cell phones, computers, those kinds of things. So what, my, what I would say to you, I believe that a shut garage door is a huge benefit to the sheriff's office and to you because we, we won't come to your house for that. Because you're not going to call me. If you have a shut garage door, it's too much work for somebody to get into it. They usually don't get into garages unless they're serious because it's just, you're, you're protecting your property and, and it's not easy, a crime of opportunity. Also, locking your car doors, taking your purses out Taking your billfolds out, taking your cell phones out. Don't leave the keys in the ignition. Unless, of course, you're in a locked garage, those kinds of things is different. But we're seeing more and more of those kinds of things. That are, when we see them, it's that kind of stuff. So it's, again, crime of opportunity. So it's, it's something that we, we find. Here's how we find people. Just right now, one of the tools that we're using. When they steal your purse or your billfold, they take your credit card and they go down to Target or they go down to Best Buy and they start spending money. And Target and Best Buy and Walmart and all those stores, they got great video systems. And we get a great picture of the person who just used your credit card. So that's one of the most effective tools that we've got. But unfortunately, it's a crime that you have to now go figure out who spent that money and then get you with your credit card company. And we'd like to have to not have to have you do that. So Lock your stuff. Tell your neighbors to lock your stuff. And when you see somebody suspicious in your neighborhoods or suspicious vehicles, call us. Really and truly, those are the things that help us the most. The, have you guys ever heard that little old lady that's always looking out her front door? <laughs> that is the best crime prevention that we've got. It really is. Good neighbors taking care of other people and watching and just being out there knowing what's going on has really been a huge tool for us. It's, uh, it's something that we do investigate. We'll go to suspicious vehicles, suspicious persons, and we just ask them if we see them. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? Are you, you know, do you live here? Where are you at? Or, or do they have car parts? Since they have billfolds and purses inside their car? You know, that kind of stuff. So it, it makes it easier for us. And again, your, your work, the people, the people in the mountains, we love how you guys network and take care of one another because it truly does it, it makes for great community, and it also makes for the reduction of crime. Just uh, neighbors report suspicious vehicles, and when the cops show up for a suspicious vehicle, they get out of it. They don't like, you know, these people don't like having the cops chasing after them. So um, we're committed to doing that. Um, we're, we're still, we still have a lot of projects. We have a lot of watches. We're, you'll see things that we have, um, uh, these VMS boards that say lock your cars and doors. We do that because we're trying to get that, that out. Uh, last thing I'll say, get on the Sheriff's Office website and get involved with a thing called Next, uh, Next Door. It is a tremendous app that will let you know what's going on in your community. It, it really is effective for you folks. I will be in the back asking any, you guys can ask me any specific questions that you have. I'd love to answer any questions for you. Again, thanks for letting us be out here tonight. So now um, we have a few um, current and elected officials that we'd like to introduce you to, and they're going to talk a little bit. Um, first of all, we have Commissioner Tina Francone. Tina. Well, good evening, Conifer, and welcome. 
Scout Troop 39 and Pac 39. I love seeing scouts, and um, I hope this isn't too boring for you, but you know, guys, this is how the sausage is made. So thank you for being here tonight. I am Dina Francon. I am your Jefferson County Commissioner. Thanks for having me here tonight. And great, what a great crowd tonight. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of anticlimactic having followed um, the Sheriff's Office and our planning and zoning. They kind of stole all my thunder. So um, really what I just wanted to tell you all about tonight is um, Tuesday we did um, approve the 2019 budget. It's a little bit larger than last year, about 586.2, I think, million dollars. So um, that will take us into 2019, and um, several um, controls were put into place this year. Um, there will be no, no supplemental requests for budget, um, budget requests for 2019, and we are probably looking at in 20. 2020, a 10% reduction across all departments in Jefferson County. So that's the, uh, the plan moving forward. Um, Transportation-wise, uh, um, you know, with the uh, failure of Propositions 109 and 110, um, we're having another revisit at the county uh, transportation plan your potholes and curbs and gutters, well, probably not up here, curbs and gutters, but your potholes. Um, so uh, we're revisiting that. We do have a, a very robust uh, repair plan for 2019. So that 2019, we're probably looking pretty good for 2019. Um, other things that are moving forward, um, we did also, I'm trying to think what else we did. Tuesday, we did um, implement term limits for all the boards and commissions in Jefferson County. Um, there are about 34 boards and commissions that uh, folks are assigned to throughout the county. I will encourage you all to have a look mm, sometime around May to see um, what what committees you think you might want to serve on. Um, those terms are you know periodically come up. Generally in July, um, applications start being taken, and through August, you know, we go through the review process. So, um, if you have a particular area of interest in the, in the county, we would love to have you serve on those. So, um, I am still your county commissioner through uh, middle of January. Uh, my email address is commish3 at jeffco.co. So if you have questions, you have comments, please feel free to always call me, email me, stop me in King Supers. Um, but thank you so much for your, for your time and your commitment to your community here today. Thank you. Okay, and Tina, we just want to present you with a certificate of appreciation for your support of Conifer Area Council and the entire Conifer community. Um, Tina's been coming up here as our TD director and commissioner. So, Tina, thank you. And next we have our newly elected commissioner, Leslie Downpepper. Leslie. Thank you, Shirley. Hello, everyone. How are you tonight? It's so good to be here with you, and I want to take a moment to give a huge shout out to Tina Francone. She has been an incredible commissioner over the last several months, and I think she deserves another round of applause for her leadership. <laughs> and I'm so grateful to Tina for reaching out shortly after the election because we're both committed to making sure that this is a very smooth transition. So we're going to have coffee on uh, Friday, and Tina was great. She said, let's make sure we go somewhere where they have big tables where we can spread out and talk about issues and, and go over some documents. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation. For those of you who don't know me, uh, our family has called Jefferson County home for 24 years. We think it's a great place to raise a family, to start a business, or to retire. So far, we're two for three on that list. Uh, my husband is a member of the West Metro Fire Board. My daughter, Grace, is a sophomore at Lakewood High School. I have worked for 30 years in both the nonprofit arena, mostly in K-12 education, as well as the private sector. I had my own business for 10 years. And I've also, over the last year, 
have worked really hard to deepen my understanding and knowledge about the, our mountain communities, from conifer to evergreen to pine and elsewhere. And I am a member of the Conifer Chamber of Commerce. I attend those meetings regularly so I can hear what issues are important to business leaders, our nonprofit leaders, and community members. I know Shirley will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've attended almost every Conifer Area Council meeting uh, to learn more about planning and zoning, wildfire management, and more. I really look forward to working with you in the coming months and years on everything from development to planning and zoning. I had an opportunity uh, with many of you who are here tonight to sit in on the water symposium, which was a great conversation about water and the connection in terms of uh, planning and zoning, development and growth, and how critical this natural resource is. And we know as more businesses and families move to Jefferson County, we at the Board of County Commissioners have to be very thoughtful and purposeful when it comes to growth and development and ensure that we're protecting our natural resources and that we're also respecting property rights and ensuring that we're talking with citizens and gathering your input at every step of the way. So in addition to those issues, we have other issues like housing, aging, and more. And I think I'm getting the sign from Angela in the back. I look forward to talking with you. I'll be here uh, accessible and look forward to hearing what issues matter most to you and working with you in the future. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, Leslie. And next we have um, State Representative Tim Leonard, I think. There he is. Um, and um, he is our current state legislator, so Tim. Well, thank you very much, Shirley. Thank you all for being here, and congratulations to Leslie on her victory. I'll fill you a little in what's gone on under the Capitol. Um, in our elections, uh, the State House has 65 people and 35 in the State Senate. So all House members, all 65, are up for re-election every two years this year. And uh, the Senate about half, because they serve four-year terms. So in this last election, um, the, it's, we've always had a split House and Senate. So the Republicans um, had the majority in the Senate, and the Democrats had the majority in the House. And then, obviously, there was a Democrat governor. So the governor stayed Democrat, but the, and the House stayed uh, Democrat and gained some seats. So it was about a seven-seat difference, and now it's about a ten-seat difference. There's about three seats that are pretty close that they haven't figured out yet, but at least there'll be a, probably about a ten-seat difference, uh, more Democrats than Republicans. And then in the Senate, where there was a one-seat majority with the Republicans, now there's going to be a three-seat majority with the Democrats. So that's what we call a trifecta, which is basically the Democrats will control the um, both chambers and then also the governorship. So last time we had, that was about five years ago in 2013, and then about 14 years ago it was the Republicans that held all three. So um, what that means to you is that usually uh, bills that are um, a little out of the ordinary, pushing one extreme or the other, pass one chamber and then get killed in the other. And um, so what usually we see is a pretty bold agenda that comes on by the party that's in control. And um, so we'll see more of that. So that in these years that there is um, one party that controls all three chambers and the governorship you need to have a lot of voice in there. You need to be able to um, make sure that your voice is being heard because that's part of that calming um, atmosphere, less laws get made one year and then have to get reversed the other year because they're pushing the envelope. So um, I was not up for re-election. Um, I'm glad that I've been able to represent our community in the House for the last three sessions. Lisa Cutter will be your replacing me as your new state representative, and then uh, Tim Neville, who is our state senator, um, is going to be replaced by Tammy Story, and so she'll be our new state senator here too. So um, we welcome them in in January. They'll be uh, sworn in and they'll start in with their, their next session. So um, one of the things you'll need to keep a focus on is money, always, as you should. These two transportation bills, as we heard the gentleman from CDOT say, uh, both failed. One of them, the 109, was, was actually my bill and Tim Neville's bill. 
that was killed, and that was the one of let's fund two hundred three and a half billion dollars worth of roads without raising taxes. You probably remember, um, I think twice, but at least once I know, I've displayed a chart showing what our budget and how much our budget has grown. Our budget in the state has grown this year. Um, already the numbers are coming in for the legislature to budget. A billion five more revenue than last year. And 10 year, 20 years ago, our budget was at $10 billion. Then the next year was $11 billion, then $12 billion, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Last year, it was $30 billion. This year, it'll be $32 billion. So that's how much we're growing in revenue. So whenever you hear cuts, just remember that's just cuts in forecast or cuts in projected budgets. Everything is growing all the time. And um, the two focuses of attention, as usual, will uh, be transportation this year, probably more so than usual because of these uh, two bond issues uh, didn't pass. And by Tabor, we need a vote of the people to make a bond pass. And um, it's very difficult to do a road project that's significant um, without doing a bond. You can't just save millions of dollars each year and then do a $500 million project. You need to do them all at once. So we do need to bond it. So I always encourage people to pass bond issues that have identified transportation projects. One of them did this year, and one of them was a little bit open. I think that's probably why that one didn't pass. Plus, it asked for new revenue. So um, rest assured, the state has plenty of revenue, another billion um, and a half. Uh, Para is going to get funded again by uh, two point uh, or two hundred twenty-five million dollars. So that will continue to be solvent. So um, that's kind of the picture under the state capital. So thank you very much for the opportunity to address you today, and thanks for allowing me to be your state representative. Thank you. And Tim has been to many, many of our Conferary Council meetings, and. So we want to thank you for your support of Conifer Council and our community. And um, like Tim said, Lisa Cutter um, is the new state representative and she will be at the next meeting, so you can meet her then. Um, and now, um, our new, newly elected state senator, Tammy Story, is here, and she's going to say a few words. coming out tonight. I really appreciate you all being here. It's great to see so many people from the Conifer community. My name is Tammy Story and I am a senator-elect for this district, Senate District 16. Um, and just quick geography lesson, it is the mountains of Jefferson County, so more or less west of C-470, more or less west of Highway 93 from Golden to Boulder. Um, and it goes from the southern from the southern tip of Jeffco to the northern boundary of Jeffco, the western boundary of Jeffco, and then those two highways kind of on the eastern side. It's a southern um, swath of Boulder County that includes Superior, El Dorado Springs, and Eldora. It's all of Gilpin County, and it's the southwest corner of Denver County. Um, so I'd just like to share that um, during the campaign, I spent countless days, many, many hours out knocking on your doors and the doors of others in Senate District 16 to really find out what issues and concerns that the people in this district had. And over the course of time, there were several issues that came up over and over again. And the top issue um, was public education and a real need and desire to have a strong public education system so that our kids are really prepared for the 21st century economy and ready to get out, get out there and either go into the world of work or on to college or um, into vocational um, or trade apprenticeship type programs. Um, another issue that came up over and over again, as um, Tim was discussing, is our transportation issues. And traffic is a, is a problem that many of us experience on a regular basis, um, whether it is our commuter time, going to and from work, or um, our weekend travel, going back and forth to the mountains, whether it's summer or winter. 
And so these are issues that we really do need to start getting on top of. Um, we have so much more growth coming into Colorado. More people are wanting to uh, live here and stay here, and who wouldn't? It's a pretty great place to live, work, and play. And um, so the need to get going on those traffic issues are important, and also the quality of our roads which was reflected in two bills that were um, on the ballot, um, and it was mentioned neither of them passed, but um, that is a concern to many people, the quality of our roads and the need to work on um, that transportation infrastructure. And another issue that came up again and again also was um, environmental causes, a need and a want to preserve and protect our open space and our public lands, and a desire to have ensure that we have clean air, land, and water going forward. And so those issues in particular are things that um, I intend to work on when uh, I'm able to get to work in January. Um, and so I really look forward to having that opportunity to work with all of you. I spent a lot of time out knocking on your doors, and now I'm counting on you to come knock on mine. So thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to having conversations with you going forward. Thank you, Tammy. And we look forward to having um, all of our um, elected officials here at future town hall meetings so we can know what's going on. So next, we have Joe Sean Kennedy, who's with the U.S. Forest Service, and I, I think he's going to be talking about a few things. There you go. Uh, thank you, Shirley. Uh, good evening, all. My name is Joe Sean Kennedy. I'm the District Fire Management Officer for the South Platte Ranger District of the Pike San Isabel National Forest. That's a mouthful. I also have uh, responsibility for the Arapahoe Roosevelt portions of Park and Jefferson County, so Maxwell Falls areas as well. A couple things that we wanted to mention to you tonight. We did move our, our office. Uh, anybody know where our new office is? King's Valley. Kings Valley. So CDOT, we support that as well. That is a tough left. So at our new location, for one more week, we will have Christmas tree permits. We go through just under 10,000 permits a year, and a lot of them are mailing, but we do do in-person uh, permit sales. I'm not the permit guy, I'm the, the fire guy, so I don't know all the ins and outs, but I do know that they're on sale for one more week, and that they'll start there. Um, we have a lot of questions about recreational shooting. I am not the shooting guy either. That's our law enforcement. But there will be a news release coming out on Saturday about our Southern uh, Area Partnership, Shooting Partnership. So look for that. What I am here to also talk about, which I kind of know a little bit about, is wildland fire and prescribed fire. So as you all have known, we had a very dry summer. We lucked out here. We did have 42 starts on our district. We were pretty busy. Uh, we also supported just about every large fire that was in Cal uh, Colorado, as well as all the other states. Uh, we don't have anybody in, in California right now. Most of those are actually um, state fires, but we do have a couple of our cooperators uh, helping out there. We do plan to do some prescribed fire. I'm not sure how many folks have ever heard me speak before, but we do live in a fire adapted ecosystem. Fire is part of our culture here, part of our ecology. We've been so good about it for the past 110 years that now we have overgrown forests and too many fuels, and that's the reason that a lot of our fires are more resistant to control and burn hotter and larger. So the only way that we're going to get out of that debt is if we purposefully, when, control, uh, when conditions warrant, burn ourselves. If we don't, Mother Nature's going to come in, just like the campfire out of paradise, and do that here. How many folks have lived here for 10, 15 years? 30, 40? So you're well aware of the Buffalo Creek fire, the Hayman fire, it's over. I'm not preaching to the choir. There's a stat that's been thrown out there many times. There's more homes threatened here in Conifer and Evergreen than L.A. County and San Diego County combined. So it's not if, it's when. So we need to do what we can 
as we can when conditions warrant. So we were about to attempt it about a month ago up by Harris Park in Park County to do a prescribed fire. We lost some of our resource availabilities and other fires started somewhere else, so we didn't do it. But what, now that we've got the snow, we're about to go into full on uh, pile burning mode as we can. So if you're interested, I've got a map in the back where all of our uh, pile burn units are. Some of our broadcast or larger uh, burn units that we're looking at, Harris Park. We're going to start with uh, about two, 300 acres there. We're also looking at some stuff down by Lone Rock, uh, just outside of Deckers. A couple units down there. And then also over in Douglas County, up by, off of Rampart Range Road. So we're trying to look for some diverse areas, which uh, will give us different opportunities and different windows to, to burn. So thank you very much, Shirley. Am I ready? Thank you, Joe Shine. So Joe Shine will be back in the back, and all of our other speakers are going to be around to talk to you, um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'd like to thank again Nancy Woodson Real, Real Estate for um, her community support of tonight's town hall meeting. Um, our next town hall meeting is going to be Wednesday, February 27th. So I hope you all can be here. If you haven't um, already put your email address um, down, if you're not already getting emails, um, please do that. We will let you know when the community meetings, the town hall meetings, and we will be sending the developments out, the development updates out once per month. So um, you can kind of keep up to speed with what's going on around here. Um, Couple other things. Um, Conifer Council actually has King Super's cards um, for sale to help, help support um, our town hall meetings and trails, and we're working on a whole bunch of other things too. So um, if you'd like to see Angela in the back for that, um, she, you can also see Angela about um, Salvation Army and ringing the bell this Christmas. It's a lot of fun. Um, Please join us for the Conifer Christmas Parade on December 1st and all of the other activities that the Chamber is putting on. Um, and happy holidays. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, there's maybe still cookies and water and coffee in the back. And please stay to talk to um, anyone you'd like to that's still here. Thank you so much.